a playlist original. Of the Science Podcast with your girl and with Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the Root of the Science Podcast with your girl and with an E. It's 2022. Can you believe it? This means that it's season three of the podcast. Oh my goodness, I am so 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 excited. If you are new here, thank you, thank you, thank you for tuning in. Now, for my fellow old listeners, thank you so much for coming back. Remember that if you want to subscribe and listen to the show, you can do so on Apple Podcasts, your Spotify, or Google, or wherever else you listen to your podcast. So for today, my guest is Rufaro Samanga from South Africa. She's an epidemiologist, a culture writer, a public health writer, and speaker who is passionate about addressing misinformation around COVID vaccine hesitancy. In this episode, she shares about her academic journey, specifically how she found out about a career in epidemiology. Rufaro gets open and honest about the challenges in her academic journey and the mental health struggles she had to overcome in the process. She then explains how the lessons in her own academic journey will positively shape the type of academic she aspires to be, particularly for Black students. Rufaro explains to us what her role as a digital epidemiologist is, which is her current job. Lastly, she discusses the future prospects of her pursuing a PhD in public health, specializing in epidemiology and biostatistics. Her topic of interest will be on COVID-19 hesitancy in South Africa. Tune in as we hear about all of this and of course, so much more. Let's go. Hi, Rufaro. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. Oh, I'm so, so, so excited to have you. Like, I've been fangirling <laughs> for the longest time. So, like, this is long overdue, but we are here. So, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on to the show. Absolutely. Yeah. So, before we get into it, I'm sure everyone is like, oh my gosh. And you always say this about everybody. So, please, may you introduce <laughs> yourself so that people can understand why I'm so excited to have you. So, where are you currently based and what do you currently do? Just in brief before we get into it. Sure. Um, so, I'm Rufaro Samanga. I'm an epidemiologist by profession. I'm currently based in Johannesburg, South Africa. And I work for a data science company where I am a digital epidemiologist epidemiologist where I'm basically trying to bridge the gap between data science and artificial intelligence with traditional epidemiology and biostatistics. When I'm not doing epidemiology, I'm writing a bunch of stuff about, you know, science and public health and doing a lot of addressing misinformation, especially around COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. So that's basically me in a nutshell. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic. And I love how you've already brought that up in the beginning. We're going to get into the digital epidemiology yeah. um, later, but you did mention that away from the sciences, you actually do have um, other interests you're not just a yeah. scientist you know which I absolutely love and you've had a very like non-linear academic journey um you touched on the stuff yeah. that you do so like you the the writings mm -hmm. that you do can you just tell us more about you away from the science and then we get into all of that how did you get involved in that for sure so I always say you know I had a very traditional academic career mm -hmm. but in terms of my professional career that's been a little unconventional mm -hmm. um so of course all my qualifications were in the sciences but in terms of outside of the sciences I you know was involved in the student Christmas Four movement back in 2015 yeah. 2016 and I started freelancing for a company called OK Africa so you know I'd write opinion pieces about this is what's actually happening on the ground. You know, this is how students are mobilizing, talking about militarization of campuses, fighting against the police and all of those things. So that was my entry point into writing. So it was basically about student mm -hmm. activism. And, you know, as I continued with my studies, I still continued to write. And, you know, as time went on, I didn't only, of course, write about student activism. I started writing about a, a bunch of other things, you know, as a Black feminist, you know, I would write things about Black feminism through different lenses. Um, I wrote about gender-based violence, very important woman. I'm, I'm a lover of 
books, African literature especially. So I did a lot of work around highlighting really influential Black women writers in the space, um, the African literature space. And from there, I just, you know, kept writing. I wrote about sex. I wrote about relationships. I wrote about politics, which, you know, pissed a lot of people off. Um, I wrote about <laughs> activism in general. <laughs> so yeah, that's the writing side of things. I would be what you call a culture writer, you know, in the sense that you really are writing about the culture, but the culture in the sense like pop culture, but not just like frivolous, oh, this person did a this or did a that. Um, mm -hmm. It's not tabloid journalism, but mm -hmm. it's, you know, different aspects of culture, arts and culture, politics, um, mm -hmm. literature, film all of those things so yeah that was um me for literally four years that's what I did and then the last two and a half years of those four years I was actually employed full-time at OK Africa as a culture writer and that's literally what I did got to interview a number of amazing 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 people yeah. probably you know some of the most memorable moments that I've had to date in my life yeah. um, and it was really it was really impactful in the sense that it was a different kind of storytelling and I think at the heart of things I am a storyteller mm. I like yeah. the fact that you brought up the that to you it's a different types of storytelling because my next question was like you know in academia mm -hmm. there's a formal standardized way of how to write specifically in science yeah. right so now you are a storyteller right which is completely mm -hmm. different you know you get to have your own opinion yeah. because science for example it's more objective you have to be objective third person it's not necessarily your thoughts so was it difficult for you to which one do you enjoy more like is there one where you're like this mm -hmm. is what I love or can you just do the both and you love it like two twins if I can say so like you know a mother who yeah loves yeah you know you're quite right I mean, the two are very different, right? Academia is very formal, very rigid. It's always evidence-based that, you know, has to be written in a specific way. Um, whereas culture writing, you know, across different publications, you know, style might vary, but it's a lot more conversational. It's definitely not academic. The aim is not to bore the reader, right? I wouldn't say that I like one more than the other. I think because of sort of like, you know, my career trajectory, because I did the sciences in parallel with the writing, I developed like a dexterity and the ability oh. to move between the two. Mm. So if I was writing up my dissertation, it's, you know, dissertation mode, you know, that a paragraph is like a million references and, you yes. know, all of those things. <laughs> and then, <laughs> and then when I close my laptop and, you know, now I'm at work and I'm at OK Africa, the brand has a very specific voice, a very specific way of storytelling. Their narrative is very specific. And so it was just really Really developing that dexterity and ability to switch between the two but I quite appreciated you know both of them and I think in equal measure academia serves its purposes you know and the community of peers in your field and all of that and so you know sometimes it is important to communicate in a way that is standard right across the board but what I loved about the culture writing although it's very different in the way that it's, it's written is its ability to be very relatable across the board right so even in academia Mimic could yes. read a piece about, you know, I don't know, Zaksim Da and his new book. And it's very relatable. It's accessible. It's fun. It's good stuff to read. So I wouldn't say I have a preference for either or. I think if I had had a preference, then, you know, I wouldn't have continued to do both, which I still do now. So yeah, I appreciate for both their advantages in each case. Yeah. Yeah. I'm ambidextrous writer, which is fantastic. So now we're going to just go back to the beginning. Okay. You told us more about your you in terms of the way from the sciences so now we need to understand um how did the genesis of you getting into science even start because like you said that you had a yes. very linear academic journey so can you talk us more into you know the roots of your science um so i started off in the lab based sciences. So um, 2013 started my first year and I was doing a BSc in biological sciences. This was at WITS. And then I decided I wanted to, so there are two streams that, you know, within that, you know, biological sciences that you can either go, you can go into what's called APES, which is animal, plant, and environmental sciences, mm -hmm. or you can go into MCB, which is molecular and cell biology. And I was very intrigued by that. How do things work on a single cell? 
cell level? Because we can explain, you know, a lot of things that, that happen on a macro level, yeah. but I just was so fascinated by being able to explain you have a headache because on a cellular level, this is what's happening. I geek out on stuff like that. So that's the route that I took mm. and I majored in biochemistry and microbiology. For my honors, I did some really cool stuff in what's called nanobiotechnology. So I was basically making gold nanoparticles using bacteria. What? Crazy, crazy <laughs> stuff. That's so cool. Um, right it was really cool a lot of hard work but it was you know really cool really novel work but I was very aware by the end of my honors year that I did find being in the lab quite tedious it's repetitive mm. um, when you're running experiments you need to run them at least three times just as a form of you know validating the results that you have making yes. sure that you know you haven't gotten them by chance and I just got tired of test tubes and mixing stuff and, and this is you know not even a dig at the molecular sciences you know it's it's more than just you know test tubes and that but yeah. I felt like you know, you're in the lab and it wasn't as infusing for me as I would have liked for it to be. I wanted to be in science. I wanted to explore infectious diseases. I loved statistics, but I didn't want to be in the lab. And at the time, I just didn't know what program could encompass those things. So mm. I actually took a gap year after my honors and I said to my mom, I just need time to figure things out. I think she didn't really have an issue with it because one, my mom is, you know, a lot more progressive as, as a Black parent a black mother yeah. and two I just spent you know the whole year writing you know so, so I, I was still making um, money as a freelancer and towards the end of the year I discovered this thing called epidemiology and more so I found out that Vitz had an epidemiology and biostatistics master's degree and I was like this is perfect I get to you know study the distribution of diseases which is what I wanted to do and I also get to do all the stats which is, you know, something that I'm very passionate about. Mm. So yeah, I applied and the next year, which was 2018, I started my master's in epidemiology and biostatistics and that I recently graduated this year in about April. So it was a three-year journey, started off, in, the intention was to do it via coursework and like a mini little, you know, research project, but I mm. do have ambitions of, you know, becoming an academic, a researcher. So I asked the faculty, can I actually do this degree via dissertation? They're like, well, we've never done that before, but, you know, we can try. And, you know, after some motivations from my supervisors, actually was the first student to do the degree um, via full dissertation. So instead wow. of like a 10,000 word research project, I ended up actually writing up a 35,000 word dissertation. So yeah, it was, it was a lot of work it was hard. It was probably one of the hardest things that I've done to date. But when I graduated, it was just so fulfilling. It was just like that moment of everything that you want and have been working towards finally comes to fruition. Yeah. Wow, that's wow, that's so uh, amazing. What a journey. And um, first of all, kudos to your mom, because with most African parents, I'll be like, why you need to continue studying. So I love the fact that she gave you that time to yeah. figure out what you want to do. And also just, you know, you had that privilege to actually figure because sometimes some people do want to, but then circumstances do not allow mm -hmm. for that to happen. And also um, the fact that you had a, a vision, like you said, you had a vision, you pushed yourself beyond the limit of just doing a normal coursework uh, masters and you're like no I want to sure. do this beautiful thesis you did say that oh no it was difficult did you have moments where you're like I should have just done a coursework I would have been done with this like when I wanted to or were you, were you just like okay you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna push through I know what's happening <laughs> you know what there were moments where I was just like you know what it would have been so much easier so much quicker as well because yeah. you know because I ended up doing it via dissertation it actually added a year so I ended up spending three years on my master's um, whereas you know my a lot of my peers were either 18 months or two years mm. so in, in some aspects I felt like oh my goodness this is such a drag and I had three supervisors you know it's difficult oh. enough having one mm. Two is a bit of a push, but I had three and they were also not very supportive. So, you know, it was a outside of the difficulty of writing up a dissertation. I think also the circumstances around mm. that, you know, supervisor support, the bureaucracies of, you know, the university and all of those things, they made it very difficult. And, you know, to be quite honest, several times I actually said to my mother, I'm going to drop out. I don't think that this is working. I'd rather go and do, you know, an MSc in epidemiology overseas 
for a year because I feel like I've been at this for so long. I'm actually not sure if this degree is going to come out. So there were many times where yeah. I felt like this is not working. Um, you also kind of, you, you feel like a failure. I definitely felt, you know, like a failure. I'm a type A personality. And my dad was very instrumental in, you know, we need to do well at school. And he was very supportive of that. And I think that's where the nerdiness in me came. So I think also because, you know, my master's was dedicated to my dad, mm. all the delays and, you know, the feelings around this actually might not happen just made me feel like one, I've, I've not only failed myself as, you know, this self-acclaimed top you know, student, yeah. but also like I'd failed my dad, you know, because mm. I'd said like, I'm going to finish this master's degree. So I had many um, breakdowns, you know, I, as someone who also, you know, suffers with very bad clinical depression, there were very many moments where I was suicidal. I was just not functional. I, it was bad. You know, mm. I'm so thankful for the support structure that I had. There were times when I'd be trying to work on a deadline because faculty says this, but my super supervisors are not responding and I'd become so hysterical to the point where you know I just would not know what to do and my mom would always say to me come home you know, mm. and I'd go home, I'd leave my laptop, I, I wouldn't think about the masters. And, you know, I just allow my mom and my family to, you know, just be there to distract me from everything else that was happening. Because at some point, it actually starts to feel like the masters is your life, there is yeah. nothing outside of the yeah. masters. So I'm so thankful that at, you know, I had a very supportive and still do have a very supportive mom. Um, at the time, you know, my previous partner was also very supportive, you know, during that process. So I think, without my tribe mm. um, and these are people that I actually acknowledged in my master's and I said without my tribe I don't think that this master's would have been possible so yeah it's important to have your people in your corner because these things can be very mentally taxing yeah sure. Yeah, no, you're giving me goosebumps because I appreciate <laughs> um, your your honesty and your vulnerability because there's so many of us who yeah. can relate, not only at master's level, yeah. even at undergraduate level or postgraduate mm, level, whatever level for sure. we go through so much as students. And I think, um, especially when you are like that student who has always been a top achiever and when things are sort of out of your control, like you said, it's something to do with the faculty. It's not because you are not, mm -hmm. it's not because you are incapable capable of doing it but it's just things that are out of your hands and you just feel like everything is falling apart exactly and you know maybe you haven't really figured out maybe you do have some you know um, mental health issues that you aren't even aware of and those sort of manifest themselves during all of this stuff I really appreciate that you mentioned that you suffered and you know you 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 endured and you know mm. you, you've been honest and I know you said that um you actually aspire to be an academic, you know, when you finish and, you know, you get your PhD and you become a doctor, you even tweet about this. So we know this is going to happen. We're going to have those days where you're going to be like, it's yeah. happened. So do you think because of everything that you went through and the struggles that you went through, it will shape you to be the kind of academic that you wish you had during your master's or not even the academic, the type of support that you wish you had yeah. when you were going through everything? that you are going through absolutely I think before that even you know when you're in varsity you know whether it's undergrad or postgrad as a black student mm. you're already aware that your experiences are very different to the experiences of, of white kids right yes. systemic racism is still a thing and so that's something that you're already contending with right and so from undergrad I could always kind of tell that I was treated a little bit differently because I speak with a twang mm. versus one of you know, my classmates who might not have spoken English the way that I do, but I knew he was super smart, probably yeah. smarter than me, right? And so you pick up on all these microaggressions, these, these micro insults that really form a part of this, you know, still racist system, especially at these historically white institutions, right? And so from there on, I just, you know, would always say that whenever I'm at varsity, whether I'm, I'm a student or whether I'm a teaching assistant, because I was a teaching assistant for a couple of years, I wanted my students especially my black students to feel comfortable you know I didn't want them to feel like they're stupid I didn't want them to feel 
feel like maybe because their language skills aren't at a certain level that they don't deserve to be here. So I think already it was in my mind that the way that I treat my students and especially my Black students has to be different to the way that other people, you know, especially white people are going to be treating them. So I think there was always that one, that fundamental understanding that there must be something different that I do. Mm. And, you know, as this love or rather interest in, hey, I actually want to become an academic and more so I want to lecture students. I think after my experience, especially, and also, you know, the experiences of my, my colleagues and my peers, and when people share about their own, you know, experiences whether it's an undergrad or postgrad and they're black, you see that it's a prevailing problem, right? So there's fundamentally something very toxic, very wrong with academia, specifically mm. as it pertains to black students and black academics. And so for me, as someone who's very radical, very, I want to shake things up, you know, and, and not afraid to do that. Yeah. I think after my experience, you know, number one, I said to myself, I will never, ever, ever put any qualification before to the point where it costs me so dearly because even after I graduated I, I still feel like I'm dealing with remnants of some of the trauma mm. you know that happened during trying to get that master's right and that's something that doesn't just you know kind of disappear just because you've graduated you know it doesn't end when you get that scroll it's stuff that still sits with you and you're like geez I really wish I hadn't had to go through that and I think for me now that particular experience has added to how I felt already in the past but now I'm very clear that when I become an academic when I become a lecturer and I take on black students they are going to have a different experience mm. as a postgraduate with me versus with other you know supervisors I'm going to practice empathy I'm going to meet them where they're at and so long as they're willing to work hard to put in the effort you know I want them to want to come back there's always this conversation around why don't black students want to do PhD PhDs. Yes. Why don't they want to do postdocs? And, you know, on the one hand, I mean, it's a very multifaceted issue. On the one hand, it is black tax. You know, black students often need to finish school and start to work because Definitely. they need to support the family. their families and their communities. But on the other hand, sometimes even, you know, someone like me who in the conventional sense doesn't have black tax, I can just continue studying and studying and studying. It becomes undesirable because you see what other kids, black kids are going through. And you're like, I don't want to do that. Let me rather go work yes. so I want in my small way even if it's only within my little office in that little department mm. at that particular university I want black students to say hey I want her to be my supervisor because the way she goes about it is so incredibly human mm. it inspires me to potentially want to go into academia or to at least do this qualification um, especially if the student has been you know kind of fearful or hesitant to do it because of everything that you hear you know black students going through on a daily basis so yeah that is really the intention and I think to to a large extent my experience has really solidified my desire to want to be that academic for black students especially no that's fantastic and I love this new era of young academics who are coming up and who aspire to I love this new up-and-coming young academics who have realized you know hey I want to be the change we want to get more people who look like us into these fields of science because like you said that due to other various many things some people couldn't get to even if they wanted to but now you know you have, you have young academics who are making science and academia look cool you know they dress cool they they don't look like the typical academics they are cool and they drink so many other various things and at the same time like you said they are human they understand hey mental health issues are a thing hey you know sometimes something is going on at home you know it's not always about deadlines 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 of course, I mean, in some cases, you know, it is what it is, but I really can't wait until you become a lecturer or a professor or a supervisor to the students, because I think you have developed that keen emotional intelligence that is needed to create that support for all of these students. So yeah, I can't wait and we'll, we'll be sure to be seeing it on the Twitter screen. <laughs> we'll be sure to be seeing Absolutely. it on the, on the Twitter screen. So, okay, before we get there, before you become this amazing supervisor, currently you are are working yes and you mentioned in your introduction that you are a digital um, epidemiologist okay I've never yes. heard the term before so before we get into what you actually do can you just explain to us what is a digital sure. epidemiologist I can't even say this word probably epidemiologist <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> what. <laughs> Epidemiology. I got it. That... I got it. <laughs> <laughs> no, that word always trips people up. And oh. then they're like, oh, so you study the skin? And I'm like, no, that's a dermatologist, <laughs> you know. So yeah, I'm a, a <laughs> I'm a digital epidemiologist. So it's an emerging field, you know. Really all that means is usually epidemiologists are out in the field, you know, if you look at COVID right now collecting data, bringing us the figures, the stats, um, the projections, you know, telling us, you know, some of the the preventive measures we can take. So that's really traditional field epidemiology, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But digital epidemiology is also, you know, still very young. It's an emerging field. And all that is, you know, taking someone with an epidemiology background and Mm -hmm. experience and putting them in the digital health space. So when we're talking about digital health, usually talking about things like data science, what we call predictive predictive analytics, which is largely a function of machine learning um, and artificial intelligence. So it's really an epidemiologist who is working within the digital health space. Um, Having said that, um, I think I'm the only digital epidemiologist in the country, um, possibly on the continent, because it's not a thing that is is really common. You know, I mean, right now we're still trying to kind of strengthen, you know, traditional epidemiology, Epidemiology. monitoring Mm -hmm. and evaluation, surveillance, you know, so very few people are thinking about digital epidemiology but having said that absolutely hate my job um and you know you and I have had this conversation (laughs) before I am leaving very soon I love how we went straight (laughs) into this like well actually I'm not doing this anymore (laughs) yes continue I'm I'm So I think, you know, it's an interesting space to be in, you know, Mm -hmm. undoubtedly, you know, the company that I work for, they do a lot of cool stuff in HIV research, you know, but I think on their end, it was very premature for them to develop this role of digital epidemiologist. So, Mm -hmm. you know, what I was sold, you know, in the interview that you're going to be doing this and you're going to be advising us, and you're going to be designing experiments, you know, very much like a traditional, you know, epidemiologist and using my expertise really all I have been doing you know for the most part is very generic things like writing project reports creating client presentations um, interacting with clients and you know I do feel like it is short changing the the expertise that I have Um, I find that you know a lot of the external work that I do especially with addressing COVID vaccine hesitancy a lot of the consultancy work that I do I find so much meaning and impact in that and I feel like I'm utilizing my expertise but in this role as a digital epidemiologist I think they were excited about the possibility of having this very novel role and having this person with this expertise but Mm -hmm. I don't think they fully fleshed out what they wanted me to do and also considered you know what I wanted to do Mm -hmm. and so you know I've made the decision that you know six months in I'm done, you know, I'm going to be resigning and I'm going to be moving on. You Mm -hmm. know, I have ambitions of starting my PhD in January and, you know, the path is very clear. I want to become an academic. Mm -hmm. You know, obviously I'll always be a writer. I'll always do the consulting because I am a very dynamic individual, but I do want to be an epidemiologist in the full sense of the word and the profession. And because I'm not getting it at this job, you know, I've just made the decision that I'm not going to do it. And so, yeah, a girl's going to be leaving next year beginning of next year whoa yo listen like if anybody is sitting yeah. here and they're like I hate what I'm doing <laughs> and it doesn't align with my vision I hope this message if you take anything from this interview I hope it's this part because that is so bold that is so brave and I'm just so proud of you for just being so clear yeah. and sure of what you want and being like Yes, even though like, you know, the money, whatever, or the title sounds nice, but it doesn't align with what I'm doing. And and like you said, you feel very undervalued. You're not being fully utilized. And sometimes, you know, these titles are so decorative, like, oh no, you're going to be the face of whatever. Mm. And there's that thing, especially with black, okay, I'm going to bring color into this, but you know, especially with being a black female, they love tokenizing yeah. women and i'm not saying that that's what your company is exactly. doing but this is me just speaking generalistically yeah but um and giving these glorified titles without actually the work and without the 
the recognition and actually allowing you to use these expertise and inverted commas that they've hired or that they want you to do yeah. but they just want to have that person who's here so I love the fact that you are like nope yeah. this is no longer serving me you know because you could have stayed you could have mm-hmm. been like no maybe I'm gonna you know maybe I will maybe it's gonna but you didn't and you're like yeah. nope I'm moving on so I love that it's so bold and oh I, this is why I fangirl about you like what come on <laughs> <laughs> This is why. So next year you are starting your PhD. Hey, so is it going to be in in digital? Yes. Epi- oh gosh, you know what I mean. That word. Um- <laughs> Oh no, girl! Oh, Not digital epidemiology. You no, leaving that no, as well? No. It's you're just <laughs> you, you're doing epidemiology as the sense of it, the yeah. real, the real crux of it. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So as I did it in my master's, which was the epidemiology and the biostatistics, I'm, you know, still going to be doing it in. So it'll probably, you know, be a PhD in public health, specializing okay. in epidemiology and biostatistics. Uh-huh. And, you know, of course, my topic of interest is, is going to be, um, I'm going to be looking at COVID-19 vaccine hesitancy. Yes. But what I actually want to do is potentially build statistical models that can predict the kind of South African who is willing to get a COVID-19 vaccine shot and who is not, right? And, mm. you know, it's, it's good to have qualitative factors. Those are really good because it helps us, you know, understand the population population, what are they thinking? Mm. But also once you start building these statistical models from a quantitative perspective, you can actually start predicting, hey, if this person has been reading information from WhatsApp, and yeah. this particular website and they are part of this and, and there are all these things that we call predictive factors, you know, the model can literally then be able to predict, you know, to an extent, if the person has this profile, they're more likely to say no to getting the vaccine versus this person who is more likely to say yes to getting the vaccine. And of course, this vaccine hesitancy thing exists on a spectrum on you know, the the extreme end of it, you've got anti-vaxxer sentiments. And I Mm -hmm. always say those are a well-established community and group of people for whom there is no logical argument that you can make to convince them that getting a vaccine is the best thing for them or their loved ones or even their children, right? But people who are vaccine hesitant, and again, that exists on a spectrum, you know, often people who might not have access to the right information, they might have been told something, even maybe by a doctor, you know, Mm. who's supposed to be this authority figure, right? And so it starts creating all of these, you know, uncertainties and anxieties, which ultimately creates this hesitancy, right? And that's what we're largely seeing in South Africa. We don't really struggle with anti-vaxxer sentiments like countries in um, countries like the US, you know, and certain parts of of the UK, but we are struggling with vaccine hesitancy. One of the major things behind that has unfortunately been misinformation. Mm -hmm. And that's why, you know, in a lot of my consulting work, I have been addressing, you know, the misinformation head on saying, I know you've heard this, Mm. but let me tell you, this is what the science is, you know? Mm. So that's what I'm hoping to do for my PhD. Um, Look at some of the qualitative factors that have affected South Africans specifically in terms of hesitancy. But of course, I'm a numbers girl. I also want to see what are the stats saying? What are those models saying? Mm. And hopefully if we build a model that's able to to predict the likelihood of someone taking up a COVID-19 you know, vaccine or not. The next time we have a pandemic, which is of course always going to be a possibility and with climate mm. change and all of that, something that you know we always have to know is on the horizon. That is information we could potentially use to build on to then predict, oh, in the event of the next pandemic, what is the profile of a person you know, going to look like who is likely to take the vaccine for this new disease? And you know, what is the profile of a person who is unlikely to take this new vaccine so that's the work that I'm hoping to do for my PhD starting from next year oh so exciting so exciting I love this work it's very important especially from a South African perspective Mm. because like you said I don't think in South Africa or even most other African countries is that people are just unaware they don't know the information you know WhatsApp Facebook Mm -hmm. People are just sharing random screenshots which are unverified and people just get yeah. blown away by um, 
the the fake news if i can call it that so sure. and i mean if somebody follows you and if, if somebody after they're done and they follow you um, on your social medias you actually actively mm. work to do this on your timeline where you actually create polls where you tell people like hey do you want some yes. things and i love that that aspect that you do and yeah it's so beautiful that you're taking it to your um, PhD and we're going to just, and I think that's going to be such a beautiful marriage because you're going to be doing something that you're actually Mm. very passionate about because sometimes people do things just because the funder wants to do something. So we can tell, you know, I sure. people who are just actively watching you that this is something that you do you've been you've spoken on mm. national um, tv on it you know and um, even when yeah. they when you speak about it I listen to you and I'm like mm. oh snap you know I this is so interesting <laughs> and you you are so clear yeah. so articulate and like you said that you don't go around telling people this is what you must do I like how your approach in yeah. terms of saying I've heard you I mean I know you've heard this but I'd like to tell you yes. why this isn't and this this is and like you said the numbers aspect also kind of builds confidence so Mm. oh wow fantastic fantastic and so exciting um you know this work is so important and I I just wish uh you all of the best and especially because currently now we're Mm. experiencing the fourth wave that more people for sure get this information out there I mean yeah. You know, there, there's oh, there's so many things that you just wish people would understand more because I think once people get mm. um, given the chance to be explained to and not to just be bombarded with you should do this, you should do this, you know, but just in a manner that people can yeah. actually accept it, hopefully we can sort of mm. see an uptake of more people in the African countries to take up the vaccine. So I can't wait. And I hope people yeah. follow you. And because she shares some really amazing content, guys, like, you know, please follow mm. her. What is your handle? Just so that everybody can <laughs> follow you. <laughs> um, on so I'm mainly active, you know, on, on Twitter. That's where I share a lot of information and, you know, talk a lot about, you know, science and, and all that. So my Twitter handle is at Rufaro underscore Samanga. Yes. So that's her name and her surname, which is going to be on this podcast. Check her out. Check out the stuff that she does. And also she shares about other stuff as well. So please don't just go there thinking it's just her. Yeah, no, I'm a mouse designer. <laughs> you know, on one day you'll hear about back On other days you'll hear about my new partner. And right love we love it it's it's yeah yeah we love it yeah. we it's love important it. to be a multi-dimensional yes, human being you yeah. are we are more than just the science um Rufaro, you have taught us and you've shared so much um and i've had such a nice time chatting with you as we wrap would you please just share with us a little golden nugget of some advice that you can give to somebody who's listening be it about life or in science just what would you like to anybody to take with you um after everything that you've said you know what i think and, you know, and I always preface this by saying that the most cliche sounding things are usually the most truest things in life. And authenticity is very important to me. And mm-hmm. one of my favorite Black women is the late Dr. Maya Angelou. And she said, tell the truth first to yourself and then to everyone else. And I think that's something that I try to the best of my ability to do. And, you know, even when it comes to my career trajectory, whatever it is that I have done, at the time that I have done it, it has felt most authentic to me at the time. And as soon as it has stopped being authentic, you know, I've had to say to myself, hey, do you still want to do this? And if the answer is no, I then make a decision and I move on. So I'm always operating Mm. from a place of what is the truth, the truth to me, what is my truth? And I think if you're courageous, enough to be honest with yourself about what it is that you want and more so what it is that you don't want um i think you'll find that it's not necessarily easier to navigate life but i think clarity um brings with it a certain kind of of peace and reassurance that things are going to work out sometimes you're worried about what am i going to study am i on the right path if i'm am i going to get the right job And, and 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 i've been there you know many times but i think i always come down to to trying to really just be very truthful with myself, you know, and then to others. So once I'm able to articulate, this is what I want, and this is most definitely what I do not want, then I can articulate it to everyone else. And then I found that the most clarity, you know, usually enters my life at that point. And things always have a way of working out, but you have to tell the truth to yourself first, and then you have to tell it to everyone else. 
Mm, beautiful. Oh, be authentic, be authentic self. And you're right. This is cliche. Sure. And you know what? A friend of mine, okay, no, this is, she listens mm-hmm. to this podcast. So it's my twin. She's my cousin. Yeah. Shout out to her. Um, she <laughs> okay. always says that cliches are cliches because they happen or in this case they are true so the fact that it is a cliche it means that it's right because it it's the fact it's fact you know thank you so much for sharing your journey with us and just inspiring us Mm. and teaching us I can't wait to see what you're gonna do because oh girl I know you're gonna do some amazing things (laughs) um you know I I thank you I'm always in awe of what you're doing and at the same time like you said because you are so authentic it's it's beautiful Mm. because you do tell us that hey you know it's hard it's not easy because you know sometimes people only share the good stuff and they think oh wow it's so easy I want to be like you but you're like no hey sometimes it's hard sometimes it's difficult and I think that's why it makes your wins even more amazing for us as bystanders to watch because we are like we Mm. know that this didn't just happen you know she did have her moments where life lifed but she came back up and she's doing it so yeah I Mm. I can't wait and I hope one day not even I hope I know one day we're gonna we're gonna do this on a bigger platform with this podcast when we've got people and a chair and we're gonna do this again and we're gonna be like remember that time that you came on and you are Dr. Samanga and you're telling me about the work that you're doing and your students like I already have goosebumps just thinking about this so (laughs) I cannot wait thank you so much (laughs) thank you so much just for the affirmation you know people will say to me oh my gosh I'm fangirling and I'm just like guys it's me it's little me you know sometimes you're just like I'm just doing normal people Mm. things but then you know sometimes when you really have a conversation with others you're like oh okay I'm actually doing quite a bit and then you know kind of just have to regroup and also kind of just acknowledge what you're doing so you also don't get lost in you know trying to get the next thing the next thing but you're not in the moment and acknowledging kind of the impact of what it is that you're doing so thank you for even wanting me to be on your podcast I really appreciate it I've I've had so much fun talking about science and everything else Um, and yeah I think this is a very important podcast so I you know just as as a fellow young black woman I'm extremely proud of you for just you know highlighting the science but highlighting you know the stories at the heart of the science I think that's so important oh thank you thank you (laughs) and to everybody else who's tuned in before I start crying here (laughs) to everybody else who's tuned in (laughs) thank you so much for tuning into another episode of the root of the science podcast with your girl and with an e until next time goodbye